Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here for this really, really special Fulbright Forum panel with our partners at Fulbright Association, Fulbright Noir, Fulbright Prism, and Rainbow Railroad. We're so delighted that you're spending some of your day with us. Um, I wanted to start this presentation off with a, an announcement and, uh, and uh, you know, share that we're disappointed to announce that Bibi Zahara Benet, unfortunately, will not be joining us this morning. Um, he's still Dealing with some health issues and he's recovering and it just is the the most professional choice for him to not be a part of this conversation today and we care about his health first and foremost and um, we're sorry that he won't be able to be a part of this conversation but we've got so many other vibrant participants and it's shaping up to be a really really interesting one so thank you for spending your time with us and I want to take a moment to pass this off to my amazing producers uh, Mark Smolowitz and Jonathan Goodman Lovett uh, we together with many, many other folks have made this, this new documentary, Being BB, the BB Zahara Benet documentary, and they'll tell you a little bit more about it. Well, thank you, Emily, and thank you to Fulbright. Uh, thank you to John and Munir and Alicia and Christine and everybody with the organization for inviting us to be with you today. Uh, Emily already thanked, but I'll thank again our wonderful partners for the event, Fulbright Prism, Fulbright Noir, and Rainbow Railroad, who are really excited, are all here uh, with us today with representatives to discuss the topic of this very special Fulbright Forum. Uh, I'm Jonathan Goodman Levitt, and I'm a producer of the film, as Emily mentioned, and a Fulbrighter representing Greater New York. I'm on the board there, where we use film regularly through the Fulbright Film Series, which before the pandemic was a regular series at Alamo Draft House and is now more of a virtual uh, and outdoor offering. Uh, to um, promote dialogue and exchange. And that's something we've done uh, for many years. And we did with uh, this film being BB when we uh, hosted a, a reception with BB in New York, which was extremely successful and exciting um, when the film premiered here in New York at New Fest. Um, from the first moment I heard about this film in 2009 uh, from Emily, uh, amazing to think that that's uh, 13 years ago or so now. Um, it, it really beautifully aligned and obviously beautifully aligned with the Fulbright spirit and how readily apparent that was from the first moments I heard about it. Uh, Bibi's own father uh, is a uh, Fulbrighter, was a Fulbrighter from Cameroon uh, a long, long time ago in I think uh, the 80s, um, but uh, Emily can specify that when she speaks later. Um, but um, you know, even at that level, uh, there was a connection to Fulbright. Um, the film is really having a bit of a moment right now. We're really excited to say, uh, maybe uh, somebody working with us can put the New York Times critics pick uh, link uh, in the uh, 1986, Emily says in the chat, uh, put that in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, we we're really honored um, to be kicking off our educational distribution here with you. And um, my fellow producer, Mark Smolowitz, is going to tell you a little bit more about offerings for the film educationally and how you can also see the film uh, if you're a consumer, not in education. Mark. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mark Smolowitz, one of the proud producers of Being BB. I am based in San Francisco, so good morning from the West Coast. Um, yeah, it's been an amazing launch for Being BB. Um, we are exactly at one year. Um, it's our one year anniversary from our world premiere at the Tribeca Film Festival last year. Um, since that time, we've been in 35 film festivals on, you know, in many countries on, I think, five continents at this point. Uh, we've been opening, closing, or centerpiece film in more than, I think, some eight or nine or 10 of those festivals. So it's been a beautiful run. And there's nothing that, nothing makes us happier than when all of you can get to actually see the film. Um, you'll be seeing some clips today, of course, as part of this presentation. Um, but for those of you who are in North America, in the US or Canada, um, you can see the film right now on Apple TV and Amazon. Um, it's available for you. Um, when you go on the when you go on Apple TV in the store, you can see Being BB is featured on the indie film page. It's the large banner there. And it's really exciting for us as filmmakers that that out the gate, it's so strong for you who all want to enjoy it at home. 
Um, we're also going to be on Fuse on June 21st, um, uh, which is our U.S. sort of st uh, streaming premiere for those um, broadcast premiere who have Fuse. Um, so there's going to be lots of ways for you to enjoy the film. And then we roll out even wider in some seven more countries on um, also on the 21st. So go to our website and sort of follow our watch page and you'll always find ways for us to you know, let you know where you can watch the film. There's going to be continue to be physical screenings in different parts of the country and the world as well. So we're so excited that the film continues to roll out. Um, but here today, we're highlighting our education journey, our journey around impact. And we have a wonderful education distributor called Good Docs. Um, our intern, Paul, is going to put the Good Docs link in the chat for all of you. So check that out. And that's going to be a way for you to book the film for education settings and for it to be purchased for libraries and nonprofit organizations. And, and also Emily and BB will be able to be booked for appearances with, with the film for those discussions. So it's a wonderful way for the education sector, universities, libraries, schools, nonprofits, NGOs that care about the issues that we're going to be talking about here today to kind of uplift these conversations, book the film, buy the film, um, get BB and Emily um, into conversation with others in your local communities um, to uh, to have a kind of impactful way of um, supporting the journey um, of the movie and just supporting really important international conversations about these topics. So um, so do go to that link and learn more. And um, really just want to express my own heartfelt thanks to Fulbright, um, Fulbright Noir, Fulbright Prism, and of course, our, our partner Rainbow Railroad for participating in this wonderful event today. Thank you. And and we're going to uh, introduce our fabulous moderator, a uh, Fulbrighter uh, to the UK, Natasha Johnson, if you'd like to uh, turn your camera on and uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself, maybe in your own introduction before you introduce the panelists, uh, rather than allowing me to do it. Um, it's been a pleasure and uh, enjoy the event, everyone. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for that, Jonathan and Mark and Emily. Um, again, as mentioned, my name is Natasha Johnson. I am a Fulbrighter, I'm a former Fulbright specialist. Um, I was at the University of Durham and um, I'm so excited to be here with you all today to sort of help sort of facilitate this conversation. Um, our topic today, of course, is being BB, um, a cross-cultural exchange and the advancement of LGBTQI and human rights issues. So just sort of thinking about a framework for today, um, you know, this will be a two part conversation. The first portion will be um, uh, sort of hearing from a panel and a sort of webinar, webinar style format. Um, and so for that portion, we're gonna ask folks to continue to be exactly as you are, um, leaving yourself on mute and, um, and then on the second half, we'll be open to a much larger forum. And we invite you to turn your cameras on because we want to see your beautiful faces uh, and being able to ask questions and to be able to participate in a much larger conversation that involves us all. So knowing that, please feel free to drop any questions that you might have in the Q&A um, as you have them and our intern Paul will be able to help hold them. If by chance you put them in the chat, hopefully we can grab them from there too, but the goal is to put them in the Q&A format. So the goal of our event today is really to think about how each and every one of us, including all of us Fulbrighters, um, can promote cross-cultural exchange from academic and diplomatic settings, including in the arts. So today we want to explore the varied and important ways that cross-cultural exchange co contributes to the advancement of LGBTQIA and human rights issues, um, and thinking about how we share information, stories, and generate from those thoughts around what each of us and can and should be doing further in our very spheres to empower ourselves and each other, and hopefully to overcome obstacles to inequalities and multiple air and multiple arenas all at one time. So a little bit about the film. Um, so at the start, uh, I think Mark has sort of set the framework that this is a wide release. This is a documentary that follows 15 years of the life of Bibi Zahara Benet um, and life and career. Uh, many folks will probably know that Bibi was the first winner of RuPaul's Drag Race. Um, and I will not try to even say Cameroon the way that RuPaul does, but I'm sure you all hear it in your heads and that's good enough for me. Okay. So this film gets into the context of what it means to be from Cameroon, however, and really what the risks are that it could be associated with defying gender norms there. So we'd like to start with a clip um, and hopefully we'll have a few more clips throughout uh, our conversation today. So bear with us if there's any technical difficulties, even though we checked, so everything should be working just fine. Um, so we're gonna start with our first clip and many of you can have that geared up for us. And then this first clip from early on in the film where we get to meet some of the activists on the ground in Cameroon. When it comes to sexuality, I feel like 
the world has evolved. But when it comes to Cameroon and just a lot of African countries, I don't feel like that has changed. Cameroon is also going through a lot of political issues. So you feel like they're going to try to face sexuality right now when they have all these other things that they're trying to deal with? Absolutely not. That's not happening. So we still have ways to go. Il y a plusieurs lois au Cameroun qui interdisent la pratique de l'homosexualité. Les homosexuels vivent les, les risques au quotidien. Ils sont stigmatisés aussi bien à la maison, à l'école, au lieu de service. Ils sont rejetés parfois de leur école, à l'hôpital. On leur refuse l'accès aux soins du simple fait que c'est un homosexuel ou parce qu'il est efféminé. En fait, le problème ici, c'est la perception qu'on a de l'homosexuel. Alors, tout le monde qui a des comportements qui s'apparentent à ce que la, la, la société voit comme l'homosexuel, c'est même très dangereux. Il y a une traque permanente au Cameroun. Et, et il y a un cas de... de qui était célèbre ici à Yaoundé, simplement parce que le gars buvait le, le bailais, que les policiers qui étaient là considéraient comme une boisson de femme, parce, parce que c'est une boisson douce, parce que c'est une boisson écrémée. Euh, ils ont dû payer les frais, ils ont été condamnés à 5 ans de prison. Non, alors, bureau. Oui, bonne nuit, monsieur Lesbien. Le matin, tu te lèves, tu ne sais même pas si on t'attend. Moi, j'ai failli être égorgé la dernière fois. C'est terrible. Oui. Parce que les gars sont venus qu'eux, ils viennent seulement me tuer. Parce que je suis comme un garçon. Hey. Donc, c'est comme ça qu'on essaie un peu de survivre, on essaie un peu de se battre. Welcome back home. Thank you for... Um, I hope that people that that clip really resonated with people. I know it resonated with me so much so that um, I love to sort of hear, if we can, from Kamali, uh, the executive director at Rainbow Railroad. Um, I wonder if you can share with us at all, um, you know, more context really around what the actual sort of priorities are um, in thinking about either a local and or global movement with respect to international LGBTQIA and human rights issues. Um, and, and while you're sharing that, please, if you feel like it's appropriate, give us a little bit more background on the landscape of what these issues are worldwide, what Rainbow Railroad's role is in it, and you know, really any main international policy goals and other initiatives that are of high priority that you want us to have as take home messages today. So thank you so much. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, thank you, Natasha. Thank you, everyone. Um, uh, I think that, you know, it's uh, really happy to be here and talking about um, a lot of the powerful themes that came out of this film. You know, stepping back, you know, the, the challenge uh, in the wider landscape is uh, in 70 countries around the world, same-sex intimacy is still criminalized. Uh, and what that means is, on a practical basis, is that the environment in some of those countries, and, and I always need to caution uh, that those laws and policies are um, the legacy of colonialism uh, within the context. Um, and with the reality of, uh, for people who live in those countries is that the stigma that's attached to being criminalized means that you are at heightened risk of persecution and or violence because of your sexual orientation, gender identity, expression of sex characteristics. And for us at Rainbow Railroad, for those who, uh, who are not familiar with our organization, you know, we, uh, our mission is to help individuals facing immediate persecution find pathways to safety. And, uh, and one of the things that's really important to stress is that for us, you know, pathway to safety means whatever's best for the individual. Um, everyone wants to live their lives as their authentic selves, free of persecution, and want to do that usually where the country where they were born and where they were raised. Um, but in the context, sometimes uh, when you're criminalized um, or you're outed, 
um, and you, you, you know, um, the contexts that we're familiar with in North America are also probably in these countries where you, you know, may get kicked out of your home or you may get um, ostracized from communities then target of repeat violence. And it's the, it's the being targeted of repeat violence and or criminalization from police, which usually leads people to flee. Uh, so that's kind of the con the broader context um, uh, by which Rainbow Railroad provides um, support for people at risk um, and, and how we try to help people every day. One thing I'll say about the film in particular, you know, we're currently doing dealing with cases, a, a particular sensitive case of individuals who are from Chad. Um, and uh, in the context of being targeted by the government in Chad are fleeing to Cameroon uh, and another country that also uh, criminalizes same-sex intimacy. So it's that tricky dynamic where LGBTQI plus persons find themselves in on a regular basis. And I think, you know, um, people need to, nav people navigate all the time, whether it's in their best interest to kind of try to find a safe way to live and thrive in these countries or um, whether seeking asylum is their only option. Yeah, thank you for that context and for um, some of that insight with respect to, I would say, uh, more aptly the nuances that can very much impact um, with the lived experience of someone who um, in many ways is defying, if not necessarily gender norms, but at least social norms within the communities in which they reside. You know, and when you talked about the concept of pathways, it very much sort of had me thinking as a Fulbrighter that education for many of us has sometimes been a pathway, at least it was for me. Um, and so in thinking about that, um, you know, I think it's an appropriate segue to think about the importance of education toward empowering ourselves and maybe even being able to make a difference in the causes that we care about. Um, and I know that BB's family was another group that also very much values education as well as travel and ambassadorship and diplomacy um, and what that means to sort of widen and deepen the perspectives. And so we'd like to share yet a second clip for you all. Um, you know, and this clip I think hopefully sort of centers uh, BB and BB's parents and the sort of impact of his family and his siblings. Children, what would you like to say about Uncle Marshall? It's amazing having a family It's also amazing to see that transformation, isn't it? Like, it's still the same person, isn't it? Yeah. I like his costume. Yeah. When I started drag, the first thing that came in mind is, how am I going to make money? How am I going to live? Is this going to be the job? When we immigrants come to this country, it's very different from like, oh, we're just going to be the stars. It's no, it's like, how are we going to better ourselves so that we can take care of everything that we need to take care of, which is ourselves and our family. I came to the United States definitely to continue school because my parents felt like going out of Cameroon and having more education and living the American dream was a good thing for us. You know, my parents, they are very motivated individuals. and gentlemen, may I bring you greetings from Cameroon. Actually, coming to uh, the U.S. is something like a homecoming for me because I did all of my undergraduate and graduate studies in the U.S. Then I went back home where I am teaching. Somebody met me in Cameroon and apparently she liked what she saw. <laughs> Elizabeth, would you stand? Welcome back, everyone. I know you wanted us to keep going with that clip, right? 
you have to wait and see the actual film. As Mark said, you can get it on um, Apple TV right now. Um, but sort of seeing that clip, I think, you know, what resonates for me mostly is the impact of family. And so Emily, pop back on screen if you might, if you don't mind. Um, I'd love to sort of hear from you, uh, you know, what were your sort of choices and decisions for really sort of taking the time to highlight uh, Bibi's family in this film? I think most people probably would have anticipated that it would have been a lot about Bibi's stage life and stage presence and, its imp and his impact there. So curious to sort of get a sense from you about why prioritizing family in the film and what if any challenges were there and, you know, how did you sort of think about developing this concept of, you know, of family acceptance um, as a narrative that would be an important thing? Yeah, I mean, it stuck out from it stuck out to me early on, actually, as one of the things that Baby and I bonded over was we both um, were actually really close to our nuclear families and found a lot of support and love from them. You know, as a filmmaker, you're always looking for like, okay, you have to put together a story that shows some conflict, that shows some change over time. You know, like, is there some kind of trauma? Is there some kind of you know a history of struggle um, in different arenas of a person's life that you know you can drape a film around and you know we've seen a lot of stories where it is the case that that lack of family acceptance is a really formative um, issue in somebody's life and that simply was not the case with baby and the more I learned about Cameroon the more I was actually really impressed by them and their their acceptance of, of Marshall as a whole person including this unconventional career um, with some caveats, you know, like they were a family that were very, uh, they are a family that are very educationally focused, as you can see in the film, they, um, they value degrees, they value education, Bibi didn't come to the US for asylum, but came for education, um, and to go to school to to get another advanced degree, as did his siblings. And um, so when he discovered drag, it was a big shift, and something that he had to write a long letter to his family about to sort of say, bear with me on this, it's what I'm feeling pulled to do. And I wouldn't say, I always would say the family conditionally accepted that in a way that like, um, they were just, it was out of concern. They wanted him to be successful, to be safe, to be able to take care of himself and to be able to support the rest of the family, which is the value of their, of their family uh, dynamic. And um, so he, he proved that he could and in his own way and their journey towards learning more about drag as an art form, learning more about the community that surrounded Bibi and, and that loved and supported him in Minneapolis and in the drag community. It, I saw them all kind of grow in different ways and they um, were very generous in, in speaking with me about it over the years. And I was really, really grateful for that. Um, and it took time. It took time to build trust. And you know, this film could not have happened in a condensed fashion. And I'm, I'm really grateful that we actually finished it when we did, because I think it was around year 12 that I actually got to sit down with the, inter with the family in sort of a, a candid format on camera and, and speak to them more. They, they really wanted to make sure that I was doing this for the right reasons. And they wanted to understand why do you want to tell the story? Because it is, it is a big deal to put your story out there and, uh, it's a huge responsibility that I took very seriously as well. Um, but I really wanted to honor the, the model of family acceptance that I feel his family really demonstrates in this film really beautifully. It is loving, it is um, supportive, and it is protective. And uh, it, it's something that I think every family could aspire to, and I really wanted it to be part of the story. It's also such a huge source of, of strength for BB is his family unit. and. I don't know. My partner says we're all a product of our inputs and BB would not be BB without the family that surrounds him. And I sort of, I had this hypothesis that I wonder if BB and his family would agree that had his dad not done as much international travel and international study that he did, would that family unit have, have had the, the open-mindedness to embrace all parts of Marshall from childhood up until adulthood? And it's a question to me, but it's, it's a hypothesis I have. Thank you for that response. I mean, I'm sure everyone on this call, especially the Fulbrighters who <laughs> have to be in other countries can attest to the fact that uh, just the sheer reality of being foreign in a strange land 
requires you to have a significant amount of empathy for just what the human condition or conditions can be. So I can imagine that travels of any kind or exposure to other communities of any kind helps to do that. Um, you know, but you said you spent 15 years doing uh, creating this film, and you know, again for anyone on this call, particularly the Fulbrighters, you know that when you're doing community work, community work takes time, sometimes longer than your Fulbright commitment, but I'll leave that for another conversation. Um, and so knowing that though, I wonder if your goals at all changed um, over the course of those 15 years and what are the goals now? Like for the folks who are now viewing this film, what are you hoping will be their uh, take home messages after watching it? Yeah, it has evolved. I mean, when we first started out, I think I started filming with Bibi thinking we were going to make a short film about this first national drag pageant. And this was back in 2006. And I was just, I was probably more fascinated than anything about, you know, the, the performance of this heightened femininity. And, you know, I was coming at it kind of from that angle. And then as our friendship deepened, I just, I cared so much more about telling the full story of this human being. And it took a while to, for that to play out in scenes in a way that would be relatable and um, that people could identify with. I didn't want to make just a highlights reel of a very successful and accomplished person, which Phoebe is a very successful and accomplished person and a very strong person. Um, and, you know, it was a question of how, how would we play out the story? And, you know, the heart of that really came together, I think, in 2014, 2015, as he was putting on his last shows in New York and um, seeing if he could change the, move the needle on his career as he was sort of struggling. Um, and, uh, but, but I feel like I became even more committed to making sure we saw this film through once I went to Cameroon and filmed with the young people there. Um, it, I, I've had a photo on my desk of one of those individuals ever since. And, you know, it hasn't been easy to get this across the finish line. I, you know, Mark and Jonathan can attest, it's just, it's been a long road. And, um, I think meeting those individuals and hearing their reaction to learning about Bibi's story and how much inspiration and empowerment they took from it, it really reinforced the why behind Bibi's story was important to share with the world. And that's kept me going. So our, our North Star with this film is how can it be used as a tool to make the world a safer place for all the baby Bibis that are out there? You know, like how can we make it a little easier for every generation that follows. And, you know, I think Bibi's story really does open hearts and open minds. And I think it's it's not a drag movie on it, it solely. It's it's really about the human experience and, and the struggle of just persisting and moving forward. And um, a lot of people can relate to it. So, um, yeah, so I wonder if it makes sense to show the teaser now for the whole film. We've got a one minute teaser standing by. Handy. I'm just a male who can perform the duties which are generally allocated for the female sex. <laughs> Bibi Zahara Benet is with us, and you know she won the first RuPaul's Drag Race. It was just God's gift to the world. God's gift to us first, then the world. Yeah. I traveled many, many miles away from my family and friends to pursue a dream, and I will not stop until I reach the end of my journey. Isn't it so interesting, like how beautiful I looked back then, and then now even like way more beautiful. No, I'm <laughs> I just love my friends laugh. Um, seeing that teaser, I wonder, uh, and hearing what Emily said right before it, I wonder, uh, Kamali, if you could join us again and just share a little bit about what you think about how this film could be used as a tool. And when I say tool, I really mean like very structurally, like as you would use a hammer um, to think about how to really sort of think about how we could build strategy using this film to maybe speak to some of the goals that Emily, that Emily mentioned. I think you're still on mute. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, you know, as Emily mentioned, uh, Baby did not uh, claim asylum the, 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 or did not flee um, 
direct persecution, which is an important distinction. Um, and that being said, I think there's real value in, again, um, having people uh, understand the context by which uh, people are, um, uh, how people navigate uh, being LGBTQI plus in multiple contexts outside of uh, the United States. Uh, I think that's what's, I think, uh, that that learning tool is really important. Just understanding the the broader context, um, and uh, again, understanding I think some of the powerful images of what it's like to uh, be in Cameroon. Uh, I think are really useful, um, and I think we still um, I, I think we still just take for granted just not only um, how much. Uh, work needs to be done globally around LGBTQI plus equality, but still how much work needs to be done here in the United States. Uh, and so I think that's what's, there's real value in this film being a conversation starter um, around, uh, you know, understanding the global landscape. Um, and, you know, I, I think it is important to understand that there is, um, there's a bit of privilege even within this particular story, right? Um, I, I, baby's story might have been different if they had not had the opportunity to come to the United States by way of studying or their family didn't have resources. Um, one of the things that's really um, consistent in the people that request for help is um, that they usually are not, uh, again, they, they usually are not um, with their families or usually displaced by their families. And I think there's actually, I think that's also the other thing about the film is that it should be celebrated for um, seeing the context of individuals who are LGBTQ plus who, are, who have been able to maintain connections with their family um, when they, during the migration process, because it's, it's actually not as common for many LGBTQ plus persons that we help. Yeah, thank you for that, Kamali. And, you know, my hope is that even in our broader discussion, which is about to happen now, the time has come, community, <laughs> for you to join us all in conversation um, and really start to maybe share some other tools that might be of resource that either you've already used or working models that you've seen in other environments, just to sort of build up what Kamali offered. But, you know, we are going to switch formats as promised. Um, and so we're going to move from our webinar format to an open forum format. That's a time where all of you as participants, and I think Alicia is helping us with that. Is that right? because um, I have yes. no buttons on this side. Okay, awesome. So thank you so much. Um, and so that's the time where all of you will also be able to come um, to come on camera. And then hopefully to be able to open up, we'll have uh, some more guided questions that I think will help uh, start us off from um, some of our other panelists um, that are from our larger Fulbright community. But it's also an opportunity for you all, all of our other community members and participants to come off mute as well. Um, share your insight, share some of your questions. I think I saw one that was in the chat. So if you haven't put it in the Q&A already, now's a good time to do so. Um, and really want to hear what your voices and your feedback and your insight might be sort of uh, as we've already started this conversation, right, and help us close it out. Um, so while you all are starting to join us, ooh, I'd love to see all of these photos. Now, if I could start to see some faces, that would be great, but no pressure. Um, you know, but as we start to do that, I want to start to invite in uh, some larger questions from the other folks on our panel. So I'd love to sort of transition while we start to come on screen to Sasha, possibly, from Fulbright, Fulbright Noir, if you don't mind um, starting. I just started following you all on Instagram. I didn't even know that there were other Fulbright communities out there. So really glad to see that. Um, but I'd, I'd love to know, um, I know you've had some personal experiences to and personal responses to watching the film. And I'd love it if maybe you could start off by sharing with us what some of those might be. Um, and while BB isn't necessarily on the panel, um, if there are like particular questions that resonated for you for BB, we'd love to direct them to him subsequently to see if we can get back to him about some of those responses. So we'd love to just sit, yeah, sort of hear what are your preliminary responses, um, Sasha, to watching the film so far? Oh, hi, Natasha. Thank you uh, for moderating. And I'm just really glad to be here. Um, yeah, so I resonated with the film a lot personally, um, just as 
a queer person of color, there were a lot of things that I saw in Bibi's experiences that I also went through. Um, not necessarily um, coming from an immigrant background, but I do, I'm third generation. So there are a lot of like cultural aspects and even um, religious aspects, familial aspects that I personally related to. Um, and I think that one thing that I specifically wanted to ask Bibi was especially about how uh, I noticed like RuPaul, everyone knows like yelling like Cameroon, Cameroon, like how that felt for BB, like if that was a positive thing or um, if that was kind of like only being singled out but because they were like saying where they were from. Um, because I know that for example, sometimes I don't want that to only be my only aspect of my identity, like where I'm from or uh, my queerness or anything of that nature. So I wonder how that felt for them. Um, but there were things that I know I also talked to um, Tyler, my colleague in Fulbright Noir about was um, there was a part of the film where Bibi mentions um, being the star and always feeling like that was what made Bibi stand out and, and kind of look away from uh, their queerness. And so um, I was curious because I know I talked to Tyler about that and we said that we felt that as well, having to kind of like, um, as being Fulbrighters, as being scholars, that being the star kind of uh, was part of our identities. And I was wondering how that felt for other Fulbrighters on this panel or other people who, you know, may have gone to university or had that same educational background, how that felt for other people, um, or if that was something that we can, Tyler and I just met, talked about. <laughs> I mean, those are really good questions. I thank you for framing them that way, you know. I think the, uh, the I, I wonder, I think I'm curious as well about, you know, your question around the, the calling of Kim Maroon. Um, you know, I, I don't know how others felt when they heard it, but for me, it wasn't jarring. I also, I always thought it sounded more like a battle cry than anything else. Um, but that's just my perception. We'll have to check in with BB and see what, and see what they say. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, I'd love to hear from other Fulbright stars out there because I've just given you a new title. Thanks, Sasha. Right. But just thinking about what it means to be like in the limelight. What is that? And particularly what it means to be in the limelight when the stage is foreign um, oftentimes. And, and how do you navigate that? So uh, for folks who think they have some insight there, um, we'd love to hear from you. But in the meantime, uh, for interest of time, I want to make sure that we at least hear the voices of everybody on this panel at least once. Um, I'd love to also try to sort of bring Olivia into this conversation. I'm wondering, you know, what were your thoughts? What were any of your immediate thoughts um, with respect to uh, watching the film? Did you have any thoughts specifically around the idea of fear and what that means? I know for myself, I try to think about fear as an acronym now because that makes it less scary. Um, but I wonder what, what any of your thoughts might have been um, as, after you've watched it. Yeah, thank you so much, Natasha. And, and thank you, everyone, for having me here. Um, I definitely resonated with the idea of um, the fear of vulnerability that BB brought up throughout the film. And I know, I mean, I've, I've had moments in my life where I felt vulnerable, but nothing compared to coming out, you know, to my family and um, feeling that worry and that fear of um, going into the and, and having my Fulbright grant in Cote d'Ivoire in the continent of Africa. And, you know, as um, Kamali was saying, like I, I went into my grant very intentional knowing that there are many countries in the world, 70 countries right now, where same-sex um, activity is criminalized. And also knowing that I had sort of this, you know, a bit of grace as an American and knowing my positionality as a white woman. But um, I, you know, one of the things BB says throughout the film is, why should I be vulnerable if it'll be used against me? And this is something that resonated with me a lot. And as I was working with my co-teachers and, and having various individuals, I had even a co-teacher ask me to teach on the gay problem in America and um, sort of navigating around that. And, um, you know, knowing that I was in a in, a, in an entirely different culture and sort of treading this fine line of respecting cult these cultural norms, but also um, wanting to speak to my queer identity, but sort of biting my tongue in those moments where I felt like I couldn't. Um, and I know also Bibi's mantra throughout the film is, um, I know one of, one of his good friends was saying, you know, I deserve it and I've got nothing to lose. And this is something that after watching this film, um, I think I'm gonna keep in the back of my head. I'm gonna have Bibi in the back of my head probably th for the rest of my life. But um, 
this is why it's so important when we're thinking about the larger idea of how we as full writers are positioned to, um, you know, raise awareness for LGBTQI, the LGBTQI community all over the world, why, you know, affinity groups such as Fulbright Prism and Fulbright Noir and Fulbright Latinx um, and Fulbright Families and Fulbright Lotus are so important. You know, Michaela, Tim, and Lara, the founders of Fulbright Prism, they had the idea of Fulbright Prism through seeing Fulbright Noir, and they were inspired to create this safe space for LGBTQI Fulbrighters. And um, through Fulbright Prism, we have a lot of resources. Um, we have a resource library, um, for you know inspiring lesson plans for individuals um fulbrighters and we even have you know there's resources for etas if your fulbright grant um the certificate of completion that you have if you don't identify with that name or gender anymore to change that um and these resources and, and this this space is created for and by fulbrighters queer fulbrighters and i didn't even know fulbright prison existed when i was going through my um my fulbright grant and I came back and I learned from my friend, actually, Ashley Moorfield, who's the communications coordinator for Fulbright Noir. And she was saying, I think this is something you'd be really interested in, you'd really love. And I can't imagine, you know, having known this space and having felt this love and support going into my Fulbright grant, because I didn't feel like there was a huge space to talk about my own queer identity. Um, and this, you know, just having this unconditional support and celebration and understanding this, the difference, and I still feel this in the States, but the difference between toleration and celebration. Um, and once you feel that in this community, it, it, it makes a world of difference. And I think Bibi, Bibi's mantra is just, you know, it's unconditional celebration for himself and everybody around him. And he just emanates this love. And I, I feel lucky to have watched this film and to be a part of this panel. So thank you so much. Thank you for that response, Olivia. I think you uh, highlighted probably a lot of my sentiments about my own Fulbright experience. I had I didn't know Fulbright Prism, Fulbright Noir. I knew none of, nothing else existed. I was out there by myself. So um, I definitely think knowing these communities have been there would have made a difference. Well, if they were founded by then, I'm old. Um, would have made a huge difference in my Fulbright experience. Um, you know, but what I also heard you say, which really resonated, was you know the sort of the sort of uh, responsibility it takes to sort of think about how to navigate the multiplicity of your identities and sort of being able to sort of navigate, you know, how to elevate one or, or many of them forward at different times as you sort of assess wellness, safety, and lots of other sort of factors with respect to an environment. And I think that that's something that um, really resonated in the film, something that you spoke about too. And I think something that also might very much be at the center of sort of, you know, what the pressures are when uh, Sasha said, you know, you are like a Fulbright star. And so as Sasha, as you sort of uh, talked about that that piece and, and mentioned Tyler, I want to bring Tyler back into the conversation if you're still with us or bring you into the conversation. Let's you sort of see if you have any insight about sort of either of the points that both Sasha and Olivia made around identify uh, the complexities of working with identity and multiple identities and also this concept of you know maybe what that means in the space of Fulbrightisms and like being a Fulbright star is Tyler with us still I saw Tyler yes okay hi awesome. thank you Natasha thank you um yeah so like Sasha had already said um I also related with the theme of um being the star out of fear um, I did my Fulbright in the Netherlands and I'm actually still living out here. Um, and I, I experienced the same thing, but instead of, um, you know, as a queer person, because um, I don't identify as uh, queer, but as a black woman, right? So in terms of racial identity, I work at a Dutch school. Um, I'm one of two black teachers. I'm the only American teacher. Um, so I'm constantly afraid I'm going to say the wrong thing or I'm constantly afraid um, my students or my colleagues won't understand my point of view or they won't be empathetic. Um, and that also brings me to um, the theme of like vulnerability. Um, that was something that I also connected with in the film. Um, Bibi's willingness well, also like the resistance to it as well, right? Um, because I think at one point it was mentioned that um, they have they really struggle with being vulnerable as I do. Um, and in that moment of like being vulnerable, you say, like Olivia had said, mentioned earlier that took place in the film, why be vulnerable when this could um, be thrown back at me? And I've experienced that um, here 
Um, but yeah, I guess then one of my questions for BB was, you know, what steps did they take um, to be more vulnerable and to not worry so much about what the outcome of that vulnerability would be? Yeah, thank you for that, Tyler. Um, you know, Bibi's not here to answer that question directly, but I think as I heard, as I listened to what you had to say, uh, I know I've had my own work around vulnerability. I think vulnerability is real work. Like it's like, like you're in the gym pumping iron, um, but like, you know, the pumps are coming from the heart as opposed to from the arm. And I think that, you know, at least for me on that journey to sort of get to a place of vulnerability, I've just gotten so present to how strong one has to be in order to be able to be a stand for that and how they navigate all of their endeavors. Um, and for me, what's been really been working is just getting present to the assurance and the faith that I'm always going to take care of myself, regardless of the environment. And the more I can comfort myself with that reality, because it's a truth, the easier easier I can show up vulnerable in every environment, in every situation, because I know that whatever is going to be present, I'm always going to be able to take care of myself and my well-being. So that's been really helpful and assuring. And I know that sounds a lot easier said than done, because that takes actually a lot of work. But um, I do offer that um, in the absence of BB and what, uh, and what his response might be. I do want to just, uh, before we close, thank everybody for attending. Thank everyone for participating. Thanking everyone for even being just in what I hope is some very critical thinking about what your next steps might be once you get off of this call and how you might be able to sort of further the work of sort of elevating the rights of LGBTQIA and human rights um, in your own communities. Um, if folks from Fulbright have any last words, Munir or Alicia, we'd love to close with you. Otherwise, thank you all so much for being in this conversation. Thank, thank you so much um, to the entire panelists and for this amazing film. Um, Thank you to the, the film team for willing to have a forum. Um, uh, thanks to our donors and members who make all of our programming possible. And a recording will be sent via email to all of you who registered. Please feel free to send it on. Um, we're going to send it to our mailing list of about 50,000 Fulbright alumni uh, in June. So people will be able to see the recording of this event. But have a great day and thanks so much.